All right, so quick refresher, what we talked about yesterday, we talked about the, obviously the definition of an exponential function. The big number or the bottom number is called the base and then what it's raised to is called the exponent. That's where your variable can go or obviously as you're plugging in, that's where your value will go. We talked about how to do this on the calculator, plug those numbers in and the caret or the y to the x. What is happening here? All right, then we talked about the specifics of these with our parent functions having, having a horizontal asymptote at zero. That We talked about that that changes with a vertical shift. Our parent function also has a y-intercept at one. And if the base is a whole number, it's increasing as you move to the, from the left to the right like the blue line. If it is a fraction or decimal, it's decreasing as you move from the left to the right like the red line. Then we talked about if you didn't know it, you could plug in points. We did these two examples and we left off here. So just like every other graphing function, you can use transformations with these graphs. Sometimes the transformations get a little bit confusing, and to be honest, I'm going to probably ask for more specifics than just transformations, but you can use transformations, okay? So the most important one as far as what affects your horizontal asymptote is the vertical translation. The vertical translation happens if you add or subtract after the function, so not inside the, the exponent. It could actually be on the front, but it has to be separate from the function and on the exponent. And when we add something there, it shifts it upward. And if we subtract something from there, it shifts it downward. That also shifts the horizontal asymptote. So if our original is at zero and I shift everything up two, then my horizontal asymptote is now at y equals two. If my original was at zero and I shift it down three, my horizontal asymptote now shifts down to y equals negative three. The horizontal translation goes right and left. When you plug in your points, you will see that happen. And it's the opposite. If it's in the exponent, then it moves the opposite direction. So if it's plus c, then it's a shift to the left. And if it's minus C, it's a shift to the right. The reflection on the front of the base flips it upside down. So instead of my curve, which typically looks like this, it would flip it upside down and it would point downwards. So this would be your number raised to the power and this would be the negative of that number raised to the power. If the exponent is where the negative is, so there's a negative with the x in the exponent, now it flips it over the y-axis. So if this is my original graph, then my flipped over y literally flips it the other way, left to right. So that's what happened when we had like 3 to the x and 3 to the negative x, they flipped. The vertical stretch and shrink would make it grow faster. So if there's a number on the front, it grows faster and slower. If there's a fraction on the front, you'll see that by plugging in your points. And horizontal stretching and shrinking would be if you could pull from the left and the right, that's your horizontal stretch. And if you could shrink from the left and the right, that's the horizontal shrink. Those last two you'll really see from your points when you plug them in. The most important thing I would say on this thing are identifying the asymptote and then the reflection. If it flips over, obviously you would need to know that it's going upside down. All right, so this one says use the graph of f of x to obtain the graph of f of x. I'm sorry, f of x equals 4 to the x. Obtain the graph of f of x or g of x equals 4 to the x plus 3. We did this yesterday. We got our coordinate points were 1 fourth, 1, and 4, the parent function. Our horizontal asymptote would have been at 0. So what did we just say happens if I add or subtract after the function or outside the, the exponent? What does that plus 3 do? It shifts the asymptote up and it shifts the curve up, right? So this is shifting everything up three places. So my asymptote goes up three places as it's now at y equals three. And all these points would go up three places. One, two, three, one, two, three, and all the way up here, one, two, three. And my shifted function would look something like that. Quiz-wise, you'll end up going straight to the second part. You won't have to graph and then shift, so just make sure you know how to plug in those points and make sure you know how to look for the vertical, I mean the horizontal asymptote, because that's going to shift. All right, example five. So this time, instead of doing the shifts, we're going to actually go directly to this graph. It would have been a graph shifted in which direction? 
If it is x minus 2 in the exponent, what's the shift? Right 2. Good. But we're going to actually plug in some points. So if I plug in the same, negative 1, 0, 1, I get 4 to the negative 1 minus 2, which is 4 to the negative third. What's 4 to the negative third? 1 over 64. Good. The negative brings it to the bottom. The 4 to the third is 64. Then I'd plug in 0. 4 to the 0 minus 2, which is 4 to the negative 2, which is 1 over 16. And 4 to the 1 minus 2, 4 to the negative 1, which is 1 fourth. So if I plot these, negative 1 and 1 64th is teeny tiny. 0 and 1 16th is just a little bit bigger. 0 and 1 fourth is just a little bit bigger. So if you had only plotted these points and you didn't know much about this exponential function, this is not a lot to go off of, okay? And this is why your knowledge about what they should look like has to come to play. First of all, where should my horizontal asymptote be? At zero, because there's no vertical shift. And what's supposed to happen as these points go to the right? They got to increase. So you have two choices. One is knowing that they're going to eventually come up. You could literally just draw through those points and bring it up. The other is if you don't know what it's going to look like on the right is to extend your points by plotting in extra points. So I could do 4, 2 minus 2 would be 4 to the 0, which is 1. So when it's 2, it's 1. And then I know my point goes there. And then 4 to the 3 minus 2 would be 4 to the 1st, which is 4. And 3, 1, I mean 3, 4 would be the next point. Now you get a little bit more accurate of a curve. Okay. As long as you have three points and you know the overall shape, you don't need those extra points. But there's going to be times in which you don't get much of a curve happening that you'd have to know that. So what's the domain of this functioning, of this function? Negative infinity to positive infinity for every exponential function. How about what's the range of this one? Zero to infinity, bracket or parentheses? Parentheses. Why is it a parentheses? It can include zero. There's an asymptote at zero. And it can't include infinity ever because it's not a number. Questions on the graphs? All right. One-to-one -one property says for any value of a that is greater than zero and not equal to one, a to the y equals a, or a to the x, sorry, equals a to the y if and only if x equals y. So what this means is if I have two expressions on either side of an equal sign with the same base, like two to the x equals two to the third, if those bases are the same, I literally can ignore the base and set my exponents equal to each other to find the variable. Obviously, in a little bit, we're going to go a little bit further with this, but that's the general concept of one to one. If the bases are the same, we can set the exponents equal to each other. And we talked about this yesterday, but don't forget anything raised to the power of zero is one. There is no way to determine that. It's not like you can use a factor tree. You have to know that. All right, so example six says use or solve using the one-to-one -one property. So my goal here is to change them so that they both have the same base. Rule of thumb says take the bigger number and rewrite it as a power of the smaller number. It's easier to do that. So when I look at three and nine, I want to rewrite nine as three to a power. What is nine? Three squared. So this becomes three to the x minus two equals three squared. As soon as those bases are the same, I ignore the base. I set the exponents equal to each other, and then solve, and I get x equals 4. Most of these are pretty easy to check, too, because if I plug in that 4, I get 3 to the 4 minus 2, which is 3 squared, which is 9. So every single one of these can be checked. All right, B. What can I do? Make the 16th 
Okay, so one way to do it, one way to do it is to change them so they both have one half as the base. This would be a negative four because the negative would move the two to the top and then two to the fourth is 16. The other way is to bring this two to the top. If I bring the two to the top, what happens to the exponent? Negative, so it'd be two to the negative x equals two to the fourth. You could do it either way. In both of these cases, you'd end up with x equals negative four. Still good? Okay, go to C. What's the answer to this? Zero. Zero. It's one of those ones you have to know. There's no way to figure that out by breaking it down. All right, the natural base is up next, and it is E. So that if you look at your calculator, there's a little button that says E. It is called the natural base. It is approximated as 2.7, 2.72 if you keep going, okay? But it is an irrational number, which means it's a number that never ends and doesn't repeat, okay? It's kind of like pi. So when we see E... If you don't have a calculator, you approximate it as 2.7, okay, which you can even get even closer and say it's close to having a base of 3, okay? But obviously, if you have a calculator, it's going to ask you to do things like e to the second, and you literally will use your calculator. The little e button is above the button that says ln, and you will hit e to the second and hit enter, stuff like that. The function that has an e in it is called the natural exponential function. So E itself is called the natural base. And then if I have it in a function, it's called the natural exponential function. It is very similar to the F of X equals three to the X because E is like 2.7. This is where it generates from. And you'll never have to actually figure this out. Like this is not something that you have to determine or whatever. Just know that this is something that is not just a made up number. Okay. It is found by following the pattern of taking something and adding to it, so like one plus one over n, where n is your exponent. So if I did one over one plus one to the first, it's, it's two. If I do two, so then it'd be one plus one half to the second, it's 2.25. And the bigger the number this gets, because it's exponential, the smaller the change is at the end, to the point that it starts to even out and we can approximate it as that 2.7. So the higher the exponent, the closer you get to that base. That's all it is, okay? And again, I'm never going to test you on it. You just have to know that it is pretty much 2.7. And if it's exact, you're using it in the calculator. All right, so 7 says, use a calculator to evaluate the function. F of x equals e to the x at each value of x and round to three decimal places. So e to the x and x being 4.2 means I'm going to type in my calculator e to the 4.2 or e caret, oh no, no, this one actually gives it to you. e to the x is the button and then you type in 4.2. 66.6863, which means this drops off and I would get 66.686. B is 125e to the 0 0.05 times 30. And you can type that whole thing in the calculator, 125 times e, as long as you keep 0 0.05 times 30 in your exponent, you should get 560.2111. Again, rounding to three decimal places is 560.211. What you need to do is be careful here and not round as you go. Like I can't find E, I can't do 0 0.05 times 30 and then raise E to that and then round it and then multiply it times 125. You want to keep it ex as exact as you can for as long as you can. So you want to keep that in your calculator. Question so far. All right, now we're doing the combination of the two. We are graphing using E. E is just like 2.7, so these still follow all your exponential rules. This says use the graphing utility to construct a table of values for the function, then sketch the graph of the function. So I will set up a table. 
before I even get started, look at this function. Is there a vertical shift? No, there's nothing added or subtracted outside of my exponent, right? Which means where's my horizontal asymptote? Y equals zero. Then I'm going to plug in each of these points. So I'm going to get 4 times e to the negative 1 plus 2, 4 times e to the 0 plus 2, and 4 times e to the 1 plus 2. So this is 4e to the first, 4e to the second, 4e to the third. 10 point, and I'm just going to round to the nearest tenth because we're not going to get more accurate than that when we graph. 4e to the second. 29.6 and 4 e to the third, 80.3. Now I'm going to plot. So negative 1 and 10.2, this is going to be huge. So I'm going to go by 2s, but even, well, actually I'm going to go by 5s. But even that's not going to cover it because I eventually have to get to 80. So negative 1 and 10.9, 0, 29.6, and 180 are all the way up here. This eventually has to make its way towards my axis and turn and curve. So you cannot just connect those points. You have to know to turn and curve it. If you're unsure, you can plug in extra points. I could plug in negative 2 or negative 3 and see where it's going to start to turn a little bit more drastically. But as long as you have the three points that are in that chart and you know the curve of that shape, that's fine. What's the domain? Negative infinity to positive infinity. What's the range? Zero to positive infinity. What's the y-intercept? 0, 29.6. Good. From the middle of your chart, right? Because we plugged in 0. Questions on that one? All right. Last thing in this section is on compound interest. So compound interest, and there's two different types. One is if it's happening a certain number of times a year, and one is if it's happening continuously. So a certain number of times of the year would be annually, semi-annually, monthly, quarterly, weekly, daily, anything like that, okay? And then compounding continuous is happening so, many, so often, like it's happening now, and then the money you make on that, and then the money you make on that, and then the money you make on that, okay? We did do compound interest, yep. So this is PERT, if you remember PERT, right? So if you're, think, like, if you're trying to figure, this is like you put money into an account, you put $10 into an account, and let's say you're earning 5% interest. So $10 in the account, or $100, make it easy, $100 in the account, and it's compounding monthly. That means after the first month, you have $105 in that account. Now you're earning 5% on the $105. So that's what's co compounding a certain number of times of years. A number of times a year. The compounding continuous, like I said, is happening so often that we make it into the natural base, which is why E is there. So these formulas, and they will not be given to you, are the balance, or A, equals the principal, or the amount of money you first put in, times 1 plus R, and that is the rate in decimal form, over n, which is the number of times a year, raised to the n again, number of times a year, times t, which is how many years? Again, rate has to be in decimal form. So if I told you it was 2.5%, I have to move this to decimal form. I move my decimal back two places, and that would be 0 0.025. And then continuous, which we call PERT, because it is the principal balance times e to the r. T. Again, R has to be in decimal format. So really, your calculator does all this work for you. You just have to know how to set it up, okay? So num example nine says, find the accumulated value of an investment of $15,000 for two years at an interest rate of 3.2% if the money is A, compounded semi-annually, 
B, quarterly, C, monthly, D, continuously. So start with the information that's given. What would, so this is A equals P times one plus R over N to the NT, or A equals part P times E to the RT. What is P? Which in this case would be what? 15,000, I heard it. What is R? Good, 0 0.032, you gotta move that decimal two places left. What is T? Two, number of years, which is two. Now, what changes is your N. So if it's compounded semi-annually, how many times a year is that? Half year. That's half the year, so that would be how many times a year? Twice. Twice, good. If it's quarterly, how many times of the year is that? Four. Four. If it's monthly? Twelve. Twelve. If it's weekly? Twelve. Fifty-two. You have to know there are 52 weeks in a year. If it was daily? 365, okay, those are things that obviously we assume you know, okay? And then for continuously, we're using PERT. So for the first, for A, I'm gonna do 15,000 times one plus 0 .032 over number of times a year, which is two, raised to the two for the number of times a year times the number of years, which is also two. And then I'm gonna let my calculator do all that work. So 15,000, parentheses, 1 plus, I'm going to bring in the fraction, 0 0.032 over 2. Yeah. Raised to the 2 times 2. So this is how it looks in my calculator. Would I round this? Does it to cents? Good. Yes. Doesn't tell you what to round it to, but this is money, right? So that's your given money means you, there's no such thing as point two eight six seven four dollars. We're gonna round it so that there are two decimal places. So this would be fifteen thousand nine hundred and eighty three dollars and 29 cents. Now to do the next one, everything repeats, 15,000, one plus 0 0.032. The only thing that changes is the N. So it's over four, raise the four times two. If you arrow up on your calculator and hit enter, it will reselect what you already brought in. And then you can just change the two to a four and I get $15,987.31. And then I'm gonna do it again, and I'm gonna change that four to a 12. And I get $15,990.02. Now, the more often it compounds, the more money it's going to be. So if you compare these, they should grow. Like as I go from semi-annually to quarterly to monthly, it should grow. If it was then weekly, it would be even more. If it was daily, it would be even more. And then per would be the most. So that's 1,500 or 15,000 times E to the point zero three two times 2. And that's $15,991.39.
questions. All right, so as a reminder, there's two ways to do this. One is literally use a T-chart for each of them. And if I would say if there's just one question, I would suggest the T-chart. If you are using transformations, then you can just transform or start, set up the parent function, which is what I did. I literally plugged in negative one, zero, and one and got my original parent function. And then if it's a minus two, what's that transformation? Down two. So my vertical asymptote shifts down two, and then each of these points come down two. And my transform function looks like that, okay? Most likely on your quiz, one, you'll only do one, so you don't have to like do it and then transform it, but you gotta make sure you're paying attention to, it will ask you for vertical, as, I mean horizontal asymptote, it will ask you for y-intercept, it's gonna ask you for domain range, like all that stuff, make sure you know how to identify it from your graph. Questions? Okay, tonight's homework is on web assignment, and some of them are multiple choice, but again, remember that you have to draw these graphs by hand. Okay, it will literally say, it says it in the instructions. I will dock you points if they are not drawn by hand. You need to make sure you do that because there is no web assigned for your quiz. It is just you drawing these out.